Ministerial de Solidarity meeting in Cuba calls for an end to neoliberal policies. Antigua and Barbuda celebrates the anniversary of its independence from colonial rule. And after two weeks of uprising in Chile, we look at how the country has already changed beyond recognition. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. The anti-imperialist solidarity meeting for democracy and against neoliberalism is taking place in Havana, Cuba. Over a thousand delegates from across the world are attending the event, which runs until Sunday. According to organizers, one of the goals of the event is to strengthen the bonds of solidarity between nations and to support the historic struggles of the Palestinian, Sahrawi, and Venezuelan people, among others. The meeting will also discuss issues threatening the global south, like wars and climate change. We can feel it in this room, the deep commitment to our people's struggle and the solidarity you have for Cuba, for which we are very grateful. The government of Donald Trump is the main threat to global peace and security. We have seen that the philosophy of deprivation does not stop and it leads to war. The United States continues to interfere in the internal affairs of our nations. Capitalism is unreliable. The capitalist model of endless consumption is irrational and non-sustainable, only generating inequality. It aggravates climate change and is driving us towards our own extinction. As the United States walks away from international accords like the Paris Agreement, we can say that there will be no sustainable development for global South nations, as there can be no sustainable development without social justice. Our correspondent Nayara Tardo is at the anti-imperialist meeting in Havana. More than a thousand delegates are taking part in this anti-imperialist meeting of solidarity for democracy and against neoliberalism being held at Havana's convention center. They've called for an end to neoliberal policies in the region. The event opened early on Friday with a tribute to the historic leader of the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro. The Cuban foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez, gave an opening address in which he brought delegates up to date on Cuban foreign policy and on the current situation on the island as a result of the U.S. blockade. He said that Cuba has stopped receiving finance as a result of Washington's measures and is also having difficulty with fuel supplies. However, he said Cuba will not stop supporting peoples who are struggling for their independence. In the afternoon, there is an opening activity taking place with a show entitled Anti-Imperialist Wave, Hands Off Cuba. Delegates are calling for peace and unity in Latin America with songs and other performances. There's also a big mural where people can sign or leave their handprints. After that, there is an anti-imperialist concert in the Barbosa neighborhood of Havana, where delegates get the chance to interact with members of the local community. On Saturday, there will be meetings of the six different working groups with a central focus on the challenges facing the region in the face of increasing hostility from the United States government. We thank Nayana Tardo for that, uh, for that report. Those taking part in the meeting in Havana include leaders and activists from black liberation and indigenous movements around the world. Telesur asked some of them why they thought it was important to be there. Well, it is very important for us and sentimental to be here as Namibian delegation, as Cubans stood beside us during our dark days of liberation struggle to come and pledge our support and solidarity with the people of Cuba, to plead with the international committee, community to come on board and support this cause of just to make sure that Cuban people are freed and they are given their freedom of trading, interacting with the rest of the world to ensure that these sanctions are lifted. We are standing up to neoliberalism and you know the many devastating impacts it's had not only on indigenous peoples, our peoples, but through through the whole network, throughout the whole world. So it's 
you know, particularly this region has seen an increase of attacks against human rights and we just feel like, uh, you know, there's so much uh, power and resistance right here in this conference, but also throughout Latin America that we feel it's very important to be here to lend solidarity and to tell the rest of the world about what the land rights are in Canada for First Nations at this moment. Here today to show solidarity, of course, with the people of Cuba and also for me, understanding that our plight as black folks and fighting, fighting for liberation is directly tied to Cuba's fight for liberation. We see Cuba as an African country and so we, we see our brothers and sisters here fighting and we are very much against the embargo that's happening here so that's why we're here to stand up and fight for what we know is right and for the liberation of all black people. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley says there was no cover-up by him or his government in the matter surrounding allegations of sexual harass harassment against former Minister of Sports and Youth Affairs Daryl Smith. What I had to do I have done and I did that early before this report which was to use the authority I had the authority to appoint Mr. Smith, he was appointed, and the same authority, he was dismissed. I know of no other sanction that I could apply to Mr. Smith as Prime Minister dealing with a minister. The ultimate sanction had been applied. With respect to the report and its use and its uselessness, its use, that is now a singular legal matter. And the one thing I don't do in law is advise myself, I am not a lawyer. You all may know I'm a geologist, I'm also a farmer. But I am not a lawyer, and I do not advise myself in law. And when I get legal advice that this report is not usable, I then have nothing to do with it. Officers from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Services Special Operations Response Team have conducted a raid at the home of a well-known Port of Spain businessman. They say they had intelligence of illegal activities. At this time, we have um, we have seized an, an illegal firearm. The, there's, um, we have the canine unit, the air, the air support units of the Trans Tobago Police Service. And this will go on for several hours again. It, it, it's, um, we have there are safes that we have to look at. People are concerned because I am opening the Pandora's box. People are concerned because I am moving to pushing the envelope to ensure that the rights of law-abiding citizens will have precedence over the rights of criminals. And I will continue to do so. So, regardless of where it is, this is definitely not witch hunting. Antigua and Barbuda celebrating its 38th anniversary of independence from British rule. The event was kicked off with a military parade before head of state and representative of the Queen, Governor General Rodney Williams. If or when Antigua becomes a republic, then they will have a president. For the past week, the Twin Island Nation hosted competitions, marches, expos and food fairs in the lead up to the big day. Antigua gained independence on November 1st, 1981, when for the first time in 328 years, the Union Jack was lowered and replaced with the Antiguan flag, and then the Antiguan national anthem was sung. Independence for a small nation such as ours is a fragile plot. It requires continuous nurturing to withstand battering forces, external and internal, that could weaken or extinguish it. That is why none of us should, should play in the hands of those who would encourage the destruction of our state and the well-being of our people so that they can rule over its ruins. There is a place for political disagreement and dissent. But all of us must know where the line is drawn between political disagreement and national anarchy. Today, therefore, on this 38th anniversary of our country's independence, as one people, one nation with a common destiny, I urge that we deafen our ears to the siren songs of disunity and discord that will sink our ship of state on the rocks of disaster. Coming up after the break, a new massacre in Colombia's Cauca department brings the death toll in the region to 11 over the past 48 hours. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Chile's massive uprising against the neoliberal system has now been going on for two weeks. It has brought to the surface the festering wounds of a country that liked to present itself as an oasis of prosperity and stability. Alejandro Kirk looks back. Here everyone has a story to tell of something that kept them from sleeping but they've been bottling up until it occurred to someone in government to put up the Santiago subway fares by 30 pesos and school students decided not to pay. Children are like that, daring and disobedient. Then this gentleman decided to take the piss. Anyone who leaves home earlier and takes the subway at 7 in the morning can get a lower fare, so it's possible to have early risers with cheaper tickets. The president thought the best solution was to declare war. We are at war with a powerful, implacable enemy who doesn't respect anything or anyone, who is ready to use violence and commit crimes with no limits. And war it was. Complete with atrocities that drew international concern. Many people have been injured. The former health minister admitted a few days ago that they were more than 30,500 injured patients. And we have registered more than 130 people with serious eye injuries. Every day we are receiving about 12 new patients with grave damage to one of their eyes. We believe that 25 people have been killed in the protest. More than 700 people have been treated in hospitals, most of them with rubber bullet wounds. There must be twice that number who don't want to go to hospital because they know that the doctors have been ordered to report all cases. So many people are afraid they could be arrested if they seek treatment. There was never any clean out of the army, the police or the state apparatus. And we are seeing the results in the repression now. We have met more than 30 human rights organizations. I coordinate human rights issues for the European left. And we've seen reports of torture, clandestine torture centers, disappeared people, rape, electric shocks and murders. What more has to happen before the world stops looking the other way, pays attention to Chile and says stop? Who was it that briefed the president on the day he said on national TV that we were at a war against a powerful enemy? Who told him that? There's a chain involved here. Someone spread that idea. Did the intelligence services tell him that? What were they preparing? Whoever it was who told Piñera about a war on criminals later told him about an unstoppable avalanche filling the streets across the country. So yesterday's vandals became citizens with genuine grievances. Given people's legitimate needs and demands, we have listened with care and humility. What the government is doing is offering minute increases in wages and pensions, but without touching the model itself. That is the political and ideological message coming from the government. But we need to change the rules of the game, and that means a new constitution, where the rules can be debated democratically by the whole society, and not just by the same all elite. The mainstream media danced to the official tune. Workers at some TV channels complained they were being fed the news by the Ministry of the Interior. The calls from the ministry are terrible. They should be ignored because they encourage self-censorship. I don't want to think that the journalists' colleagues are deliberately playing along with this, but it has to do with bad journalistic practices. There are very few media today that can really open up to the citizens and understand that the center of the story now is not those small groups who carry out acts of vandalism, but the huge mass of people who have taken part in the most spectacular demonstrations this country has ever seen. Although leaderless, the torrent of demands began to coalesce. The Social Unity Coordination, made up of 70 organizations, began cautiously to take a lead. What we propose is, first, discussion of a minimum wage of not less than 500,000 pesos net, the right to collective bargaining and genuine right to strike. Three, a minimum pension equivalent to the minimum wage we are proposing. Four, 
price controls on basic services, including water, electricity, gas, cable, and internet. Five, decent public transport. Six, a reduced working day. Seven, improved health care, education, housing, and social rights. Eight, human rights. Nine, immediate rejection of the TPP. Ten, a new budget for 2020. And 11, a new constitution through a constituent assembly. Santiago is living through one of those intense, fleeting moments when reality breaks all the rules. Leaving behind all timidity, everyone wants to talk in this open city. The walls become a blackboard as community assemblies, without asking anyone's permission, draw up a new constitution. Christian Inostrosa y Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Santiago de Chile. A new massacre has been reported in Colombia's Cauca department, bringing the death toll in the region to 11 over the past 48 hours. According to local media, two armed men murdered four people on the street in Santa Elena, while another person was killed in Huasano. The victims were, were part of a team of engineers that were carrying out field work in the area. This comes less than two days after eight people were murdered in the same region. In response to the growing violence, President Ivan Duque has ordered the militarization of the area. In 2019 alone, 115 indigenous people have been killed in the Department of Cauca. Staying in Colombia, students took to the streets of Bogotá on Thursday to demand that the government provide more resources for education. The protesters say that public universities are falling apart and the teachers have not been paid for a number of months. They also condemned widespread corruption in the institutions and called on authorities to step in. People can learn from us, and they can see that our protest is righteous. They can inform themselves, and they can also join the protest and suddenly work together as Chile and Ecuador are doing right now. The latest statistics show that internal force displacement has increased significantly in Honduras in recent years. Thousands of people are fleeing their homes due to violence from organized crime. According to the National Statistic Institute, in the past five years, the number of people internally displaced due to violence increased to over 100,000. Many families tell the same story of having to flee their homes and criminal gangs try to recruit their children. I had to walk on my own to Guatemala and then to Mexico. When I got to Mexico, it was clear this place was not right for me. I couldn't find my brothers, so I returned to Guatemala and I spent a few months in Tecumán in a correctional facility for minors. Forced migration is most common in the bigger cities where gangs operate on a much larger scale, in the same places where the government says it is working to combat violence. Many children are displaced, with or without their families. They are victims of criminal gangs who force them into their ranks. What we see is violence directly specifically at kids, and the response from the government continues to be extremely inadequate. According to the Casa Alianza organization, thousands of children have fled the country in recent years due to the situation. At a rate of two kids per hour, they left their communities either with their families or alone in order to save their own lives. Every day the situation worsens. Every year over 50,000 children drop out of school. Today we have more children who have been deported or are migrating than we have children on the street. Just until October, 21,000 children have been deported. Meanwhile, the government has been increasing the national security budget on an annual basis. But so far, there has been no impact on the number of people fleeing their homes. What is clear, and despite the many variables as to why people are fleeing, is that the government is failing miserably. No matter how much money they threw at the budget, their system is inefficient. According to official statistics, 56% of school-aged Honduran children cannot go to school due to poverty or because they are in danger of being forcibly displaced. Coming up, protests in Iraq are into their second month. Stay with us.
Welcome back. As anti-government protests enter their second month in Iraq, the country's top cleric warned foreign actors against interfering. Security forces have violently repressed protesters with 250 dead so far. The demonstrations have evolved since October 1st from rage over corruption and unemployment to demands for a total regime change. They've also condemned paramilitary forces who've sparked fears of a confrontation with the main protest. The protests are communal and lack any foreign intervention. Whoever said that there's foreign intervention in the protests is the one who is foreign and outside the law of Islam. The members of the government and Iraqi rule are all thieves, from Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi to Al Maliki since 2003 until now. What have you accomplished? You have done nothing. You destroyed us. Thousands have gathered in Algeria's capital for a mass rally as the nation celebrates the 65th anniversary of the war that won its independence from France. Protesters took over the streets outside the Grand Post building in downtown Algiers by early afternoon to demand a new revolution. They chanted Algeria will take back its independence and the people want their independence. Since February 22nd, demonstrations have occurred for 37 consecutive Fridays. Police were deployed in force, making several arrests in the morning. The Algiers metro was closed and all trains to the capital cancelled in a bid to keep numbers down. Moving on, new fires have broken out in California and the United States, forcing the evacuation of at least 7,000 people. Hundreds of firefighters and water-dropping helicopters were deployed to fight three new massive fires in San Bernardino, Riverside County, and Ventura County. The governor of California declared a statewide state of emergency earlier in the week, as wildfires, which have been intensified by strong winds, have continued to ravage various regions. And finally, South Africans are looking forward to Saturday's Rugby World Cup final. That is because the national team, known as the Springboks, is hoping for a win against England. Our correspondent, Matua Malachi, takes a look at the politics behind the game of rugby in South Africa. 1995 Rugby World Cup memories have brought nostalgia in the now racially polarized South Africa. The country's national rugby team could not have chosen a better time to win the World Cup. It was just over a year into Nelson Mandela's Rainbow Nation project, uniting people of all races in the country. Sports has always been the one thing that united South Africans throughout the years. It's now 2019 and the Springboks, as the rugby team is affectionately known here in South Africa, will launch their bid to win the Rugby World Cup against former colonial master England in Japan. Mandela's Rainbow Nation is no more, but government is still pulling all the stops to get South Africans behind the team. Well, you've got 57 million South Africans standing behind you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate the, the call and the support. It really means a lot to us on the team. And yeah, we'll do our best tomorrow to make you guys proud that we have been and hopefully see you in the final. Well, I am coming to the final. I am coming to lift that Webb Ellis trophy with you. So make sure that you book my ticket to the final. I'm going to be there. The team managers were strategic and selected a black man to lead the team as captain. The number of black players in the Springbok team has been a debate that divided the country. It's arguably the one national team that hasn't transformed in post-apartheid South Africa. The one thing they are credited for by some commentators is their passion when singing the national anthem, which is divided into four of the official languages. But there's another debate that English and Afrikaans should not have been added to the anthem. The argument being that they are languages of the oppressor. While that debate rages on, all eyes will be on the team on Saturday with the hope they will bring the Webb Ellis Trophy to South Africa. Matuba Mahlachi for Telesur in Pretoria, South Africa. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net.
can also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.